Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the DevRel Survival Guide. This time, we'll be looking at building developer communities. My name is Ramon Widobro. And I'm Matthew Ravel from Hoopy, the developer content agency. In this episode, we've spoken to various people from developer relations and outside to understand what is community? Why do developers join communities? And why do companies invest in them? And then we've looked at some of the tactical and strategic advice that people who have already built successful communities would offer you. And thank you to Common Room for sponsoring this installment of the DevRel Survival Guide. You can go to commonroom.io to learn more about their platform that will help you to track and measure the signals from social, community, product, and your CRM and other sources to really understand the buyer journey that developers and community members will take with your product. So that's commonroom.io. Okay, let's get on with understanding what community is. Here's Emily Freeman from AWS with her take. For me, community can be defined as the places that people gather to learn, share information, and socialize. This is a description of community that a lot of us who are DevRel practitioners will recognize and agree with. For an academic take on what community is, let's hear from Vanessa Paik, who is a lecturer at the University of Sydney, director of Australian Community Managers, and founder and chief consultant at Peersense. A community in many ways is a deeply personal thing because they are social structures, they are collective structures. However, we experience them as individuals. So anyone you ask will probably talk about and define community a little bit differently. There is some really great academic research though that comes through lots of generations at this point um, prior to the internet that helps us really understand what it is, what it, what is a community and how is it distinct from other types of social structures like a group or a network or even an audience of people. The terms are sometimes used interchangeably, um, and that's not always helpful if we're setting out to build or participate in a community. It really helps to have the shared language on what that actually is. So a community is a peer-to-peer -peer social structure. Uh, it has shared language, shared culture, shared history, shared social norms. Um, we often draw on the work of two sociologists called Macmillan and Chavis, who wrote quite a lot about sense of community as an index and a way to ascertain if what you're looking at is actually a community. And they were able to break that down into four key areas that we can actually identify and even measure. Those four areas are uh, defined membership, so that sense of kind of group identity, you know, who we are, why we exist, what we're all about. Um, we have shared practices as part of that membership set. We have influence uh, on the members of the group and that group can influence us. So there's that reciprocity that's happening. There's integration and fulfillment of our needs as part of this group. And those needs could be informational or they could be relational. So it might be very practical, pragmatic stuff, or it could be actually more emotional, more social or cultural. And last but not least, shared emotional connection that's the final ingredient so membership influence needs fulfillment and shared emotional connection those academics tend to agree the four primary decisive features that make a community a community as opposed to something else before we can create a space or a community that meets people's needs we need to know what those needs are here's john o'bacon who is well known as a community thinker and consultant and is also the founder of the Community Leadership Core, an accelerator program for people looking to build DevRel programs. I think there's two reasons why people join. The first one is psychological in nature, uh, the fluffy social science side of things, which is we as human beings are social animals and we like to be around other social animals. Uh, we feel safe, we feel comfortable, we learn, we grow, we develop wisdom. We've been doing it for thousands of years. But I think in today's day and age, sound like an old man, um, the reason why people join is because they, 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 they can derive wisdom and insight and solve problems in a very pragmatic way, right? So if you join a community and you ask a question, you get a response, that's fine. It's incredibly boring and it's very transactional. 
But when you join a community where you feel like you're among friends, where you feel like a sense of belonging, where you can solve problems, where you can learn, where you can share, where you can grow, where you can feel seen and heard, it's incredibly compelling. Um, and when that's tied around a product or a service or an industry that you care about, it's pretty cool. Many of us could learn alone, but learning as part of a community is important in helping us stay motivated and accountable, says Shedrak Akintayo, software engineer, senior developer advocate, and founder of DevRel Community Africa. So I think one of the reasons why, you know, people have joined these communities that have been a part of or, or communities in general is basically to learn, right? Have it, we have, there's a shared interest for every single member in the community. For example, if it's um, open source community Africa, it's open source, right? I want to learn how to contribute to open source. Where can I learn how to contribute to open source? Where can I learn for free, especially? Because, you know, lack of funding is very, very, is a very, very big issue in um, Africa, for example. Sometimes it's easier for you to grow with it, like when you have people pushing you, right? When you have a bunch of people pushing you. So one, one other reason I've seen why people have joined communities I've been a part of or communities I have created is because, oh yeah, I want to have um, career growth. I want to also have personal growth. And I have a lot of people that can keep me as, you know, accountability bodies that can maybe call me out when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. One way to dive into the reasons for people joining communities is to think of it in terms of place, common interest and shared problem. Here's developer community consultant Joe Nash to tell us a bit more about that. People join communities for, in my belief, uh, a variety of reasons. And those reasons tend to be um, of different levels of draw, uh, power, you could say, um, like a different amount. They, they, they facilitate a different amount of engagement from people joining the communities. So um, to start off with, there are, uh, you know, reasons for joining communities that are related to common commonalities between people. So for example, you get communities where people are, you know, they're joining because they are looking for people who share a space or a place with them. So, you know, you've got your neighborhood, uh, your neighborhood WhatsApp groups, you've got your university student societies, you've got your uh, Chicago developer meetup, you know, these kind of things. And they bring people together because, you know, it's one of the easiest ways to define who you are. Like I am in this place. I am this thing. I'm going to meet people who are like-minded or like me. Now I put that one first because I think this is one of the uh, quote unquote weaker reasons that people join communities. And what I mean by that is that um, that is often a, like that's often people's first instinct or first way they know how to find a community but it doesn't give them many ways to engage in the long term. It doesn't give them many reasons to stick around. You know, there are exceptions to that, but there's not much commonality. It's just place. So it's people in that place can all be very different, very different interests, very different backgrounds, um, and might not have a lot in common besides that place. So it's quite a quite weak reason. So we go from there to common interests. And, you know, these are often combined with the place. So I mentioned, you know, a Chicago developer meetup that might be a Chicago JavaScript meetup. It might be the Chicago Go meetup, you know, a little bit more specific. Um, and so common interest is a slightly stronger reason for people to join a community. Like, you know, I like this thing. I want to share that interest with other people. I want to talk to other people who like this thing. And straight away, you're adding a little bit more in common. You're adding a little bit, you know, you're removing some friction to engage. You already have more assumptions between the members. Um, about you know why they're there, what brings them there, um, and so it's a stronger a stronger reason people join, um, and more likely to create engagement, more likely to have them stick around. Now the third one, which I think is you know one of the uh, is is the most interesting reason, I think is especially relevant to um, you know our communities as DevRel practitioners, is people who have a, sh a common problem. So we've got common place, common interest, but common problem is where I think you really get. The magic of community happening and it's when people join together to solve a problem that is bigger than themselves you know either you know they've got a problem that they haven't been able to figure out on their own and they want mutual support of that problem they want to solicit more ideas about that problem or they want to work on something that you know is just straight up a, a big problem so you know you start to get open source projects like hey we're working on you know this framework that you know is you know, React, I couldn't possibly write that on my own. I want to contribute with a bunch of other people. Or, you know, when you start to have um, various, uh, you know, groups working on challenges in the industry, like, you know, you have Rails Girls, you have these kinds of things. Those are communities where there is a, 
a clear problem statement that lots of people are feeling and can see themselves in and they band together to solve that problem and that's the strongest form of community and the strongest reason that people join communities in my opinion um first of all because uh you know it's all about incentives right community and being a member of a community is fundamentally a commitment of time a commitment of energy a commitment of resources it's time that people need to take out of their lives to, to spend on the community and you know although communities of place and communities of interest um are are nice experiences they give us something good and there might be benefits there you know networking and such solving a problem that you have that is a big draw for everyone that that's that is something that's going to get people out of bed that's going to get people you know to commit hours of their evening to showing up to a meetup or to join a zoom call like that is a big incentive oftentimes community can seem like such an essential part of how we engage with developers that we almost take it for granted but are other industries doing the same thing for example, are there sugar manufacturers out there creating meetups and forums and Discord channels for candy makers? Here's Emily Freeman. Oh, that's such a great question. I would argue that candy makers do gather in communities. It may not be formalized to the level that we formalize our communities, um, but you can have very informal groups of people who are, you know, have relationships with each other and and communicate about their work and learn from each other. So. Um, I think community is pervasive in human culture. We are social mammals and we need each other and we long for connection with others. So regardless of your framework or your industry, I think you will find that um, wherever you go. For technical folks and, and developers in particular, I think community serves a really interesting aspect and, and feeds into our lives in a really important way because the work itself is lonely. Um, typically, if you are developing, you're writing code, you are, you know, typing characters into a machine and hoping that it, it produces the effect or the impact that you're looking for. That is lonely work. You, you are typically alone with your computer and having a place where you can then step away from that and really connect with others and share those ideas. I mean, how many times have you gone to a conference and come back at work? Um, super excited and super, super inspired with new ideas and new ways of solving problems. Um, that, that I think is the important aspect for technical communities in particular. Emily mentioned the idea that developer communities are perhaps more organized than other types of professional community. And perhaps one reason for that is that more money goes into making sure that they are organized. So why are companies putting their money into developer communities? Here's Angie Byron, who is Director of Community at Ivan. So I think companies invest in communities for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, some of them are, you know, the obvious kind of self-serving reasons. They want to grow brand awareness. They want to, uh, you know, increase the, the sort of sentiment around their product or technology, whatever it is they're pushing. Uh, they ultimately want to grow the number of dollars going into a business. Um, but I think the very forward thinking companies invest in community for a lot of other reasons. They invest in community because it helps to build relationships, very close relationships with the, you know, people who use their products, the people in the same space as them who do similar problem solving features <clears throat> as we do. Uh, I think it also helps with building trust. So if you as a company are providing something of value to somebody in a community that helps them kind of have a mental smiley face next to your company name and in further interactions that they have with you. Um, it also helps with just kind of building that sense of kind of like the halo of goodwill, if you will, around your company. But I think people are very smart and they can tell if a community is like being a genuine community where you actually are there to do authentic relationship building with others versus if it's sort of like a propped up community where it's more or less an, an avenue for marketing and sales. So. We know what a community is, why people join them, and why companies invest in them. But what are the core building blocks that make a community function? Here's North America Community Manager for AWS, Wesley Faulkner. The building blocks of community, um, I think it depends on where you are in your journey. Um, and there, there are several ways that people come upon a community. There is inherited, meaning that you have a nascent community and you have a community manager and they're trying to make sure those building blocks are in place, or you want to create a community uh, and you want to choose the foundation in which you want people to be attracted. So if you want it to be principled, 
if you want it to be one that's extremely interactive, you have to make sure that you communicate what your principles are. You have to communicate what your mission is. You have to communicate what your North Star is. If you want people to be interactive, you have to say, here's how you can interact. Here's the type of interactions that we want to foster. Here's the type of interactions that we don't want to have. A community is a collection of people uh, that has a thick border around it. The reason why I mentioned that is because community is not just the people who are like-minded and together, it is the people who are not in the community. And that def definition is in that border. And you have to make sure that you know what that is and that is codified in a code of conduct or a set of principles. The reason why this is extremely important is because if there is a member of the community who is having an issue with someone else in the community, you have to make a choice who is welcome, what activities are welcome, what things that you want to foster. And if you don't have a way of determining which is in the community, which is not, then it's soured for both of them. So we want to make sure that you can grow a community by making sure that it stays pure to that central driven, like North Star, and that it's not sullied by trying to build the biggest community as possible by welcoming everybody. Because if it's uh, for everyone, then it's for no one. And that's one of the things that is extremely important when deciding to build or foster a community. To serve the people in our communities and to do right by the companies who are paying the bills, then we need to be intentional. We need to have a plan. But how do we create a community strategy? Let's hear from Vanessa Paik again. Excellent question. So how do you build a community strategy? There are lots of great tactics and techniques out there that'll help you once you have a direction of travel for yourself strategically. But bottom line, the question you have to answer is why are you doing this? Now, you're going to have different motivations, different driving forces behind that. They might be commercial if you're working for a business. Uh, you might have personal ones. And of course, the people that show up and might be respected participants in your community will have their own complex motivators. But in order for your community to work, you have to have an incredibly strong why. And to unpack that a little more, what problem are you solving? In this sense, it's not that dissimilar to something like product design. When you think about community, what is it that the people that, are, that you're talking about here as those prospective participants, what can they achieve? What value can be generated by the things that community is good at? That's how I frame strategy. Then think about what problems your people are facing, what those pain points are, and how can the things that community does, the behaviours and activities that happen in a community potentially, how can they meet those problems? The other thing to think about strategically is your organisation. Where does it fit? Why is your organisation, your business your people, why are they the best place to do that work? That's particularly relevant when you've got lots of very similar communities, lots of very competitive communities. Think about that strategic positioning. What is it that you know, you do, you stand for that no one else does or very few do in that unique way that you do? And how can those three factors come together? What is community good at? What is your organization good at? What do you know? What do you do? What do you stand for? And what do your members need? If you can craft that, it's challenging but very possible, then we're really on the road to a sustainable community that is generating shared value. So there's a strong emphasis on sticking to our goals. Let's hear more about intentionality from John O'Bacon. Yeah, so I'm a huge believer in, in being intentional. <clears throat> I think one of the problems that we see in, in sadly, too many DevRel communities is it's just go check out our discord and that's not good enough because what happens is you get a discord with 2000 people in it and no one's talking um, or it's filled with a bunch of people who are just asking questions and getting answers and why would anybody go back to that so <clears throat> i'm a i'm a big believer in in two layers of intentionality intentionality of strategy and, and intentionality of execution so strategy is we need to nurture people right like if you throw people into discord you're going to get pretty bad results as a general rule. But if you um, identify your audience's pain points, what they struggle with, what they what sucks for them, and you can provide a rapid, 
fire series of quick wins where you can solve those at low friction and you gradually nurture people through that journey and then bring them into the community, you're going to be a lot more successful. So for example, you know, run an online meetup with a 10 minute training with some share sessions uh, where people just need to put their first name and email address to sign up and then send them great content via email, uh, invite them to events. You're going to develop a really thoughtful experience for people. So then when you bring them into your community, when they participate, they're actually going to do something and, and, and play a role. And the intentionality around execution is that sounds like a big piece of work with a lot to do, but break it down into quarters and just get started. Like I'm a, one of the things that we talk about all the time in the community leadership core is progress over perfection. Like don't try to be perfect. Just get something out there, get it done um, and just iterate, like iterate out in the open. And I actually think communities love that. They want to be part of building something. If it's too shiny, in many cases, community members are just looking to you for direction. But if you say to your community members, look, we're going to do everything we can to build something amazing here, but we need you to play a role in it. We need you to help us shape this and point out blind spots then you'll get good results. Clearly, we haven't covered everything you need to think about when it comes to creating a developer community strategy. But once you do have that strategy in place, then it's time to start thinking practically. So what are some of the practical tips that people in DevRel have for you as you set about building, nurturing, adopting, or otherwise managing a developer community? So I think my practical tips for running developer communities I'm going to focus on asynchronous and global communities first, because that's the majority of my experience from, you know, working at GitHub, working on during the pandemic, working on online communities. And there are certain counterintuitive things about asynchronous and global communities that I think, you know, I found to be true. And one of them that actually came up today um, is uh, the surprising effectiveness of synchronous online meetings even in an asynchronous global context so you know if you're working with an online community that's got members all over the world um that is working on a project your instinct is that like hey we need this to be super asynchronous we need to support people in every time zone maybe we want a chat maybe we want a forum we want something where people can input no matter you know no matter where they are in-person events um online meetings are bad they're restricted by time zone people have to get up at weird times um but one of the surprising things i found about that is and this extends to in-person meetups as well um is that one of the values of a meeting be it a you know a developer meetup be it a zoom call be it a, a twitter space be it a discord group whatever it is is that it is a time boxed occasion that someone can put on their calendar and if it's on someone's calendar, it's defensible time. And lots of the issues that people have with creating community spaces is they think to maximize engagement, to maximize people being able to participate, it needs to be like always present and always there. So people can always drop in, right? And so people can always just come and comment whenever they want. But then the problem with that is they need to find a way to make time for that. And it's always going to be at the bottom of the pile versus their other priorities, versus picking up kids, versus making dinner, versus, you know, a work call. Whereas if you make something that is a time block on a calendar, it becomes defensible time for members. And so even if, you know, you're competing with odd time zone restrictions, um, it can actually be easier for people to attend and for people to engage than a fully asynchronous method. Here's Rosie Sherry, founder of Rosieland and CEO of Ministry of Testing. I, th I think the trap that many of us have fallen into is kind of really questioning where we're contributing and making sure that it adds value and it's good money spent. Um, I don't like to kind of waste money or spend money on anything that doesn't work. So I'm like always very careful or very considerate about where we're putting time and effort. I think it's very easy to spend other people's money as an employee without truly thinking about how how it impacts a business. So if I, you know, if I could give any advice, it would be like, is, is what you're doing important? And is that money well spent? Imagine that it's your own money you're spending or your own time. Is that, is that something that you would actually do? We talk a lot about empathy in DevRel, and community is probably the place where it's most essential. Here's Nancy Chawan, engineer and developer advocate at LocalStack, CNCF ambassador, and founder of the Women in Cloud Native community. 
This is the most important, uh, I feel, uh, when you are in a community. Um, you should be able to empathize with people in order to understand that every individual is different, their stories are different, their issues are different. Um, the way they communicate is also different. So having more understanding and empathy in general towards each other really helps uh, in community building. So that is something uh, there. Uh, also always thinking about how you can create a great experience for people we we launched one program um and uh there were different people uh there were different developers at different levels i mean when i say levels is like how much they were uh you know how much they knew that tech there were a few folks who were uh using that tool and they were really great with it and there were a few folks who just you know who just who doesn't know and they just join and they're interested in it so you have to navigate the conversations in a way that they like everyone feel comfortable, even a beginner or a person who is, uh, you know, already using and they have some specific questions. So these all come under the experience and you being uh, proactive and also understanding that there will be a different set of audience with different requirements in a community. And you just have to be careful or maybe more understanding how to deal with different kind of people with different kind of use cases or they could be coming to community for, you know, different objective. Arguably, empathy is the glue that keeps your community together for the longer term. Here's Wesley Faulkner on how that can work in practice. There's a saying that says people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. So if you're able to put care into the community and grow their knowledge, then that is reciprocated. Um, and when you invest in the community, if you share that knowledge, and if you are really attuned to the feedback, not only does it help the people who are learning in the community, but it helps the development of the softwares, the programs, or the tools that the companies are making. If you can remove any pain points for a developer, either through documentation or through a programmatic change in the way that you approach uh, your either UI, UX, or even functionally, then that's making what you do better. And that symbiosis of community, of giving to the community so they learn, they reciprocate by giving you pain points that they like changed. And then you make a better product then you get more people in your community learning and then you get more feedback. And that virtuous cycle really pays back dividends in terms of goodwill and adoption. And it is really, really hard to switch uh, develop environments, tools. And so if you are able to show that you're able to listen to the community and invest in the community, then people feel better about sticking with your product because they don't have to worry about uh, saying that if there is something wrong, it will get fixed. That is the, the goodwill that you buy. Um, but also as you build up a community, um, it makes it harder for people to not just leave your products, but to leave the people that they've met and the people in the community. Um, so it is kind of a, it, that symbiosis is something that's extremely important to make sure that uh, the care and feeding is there and the loyalty is there. Any breakdown in any of those components can make the whole thing kind of crumble. So making sure that investment continues and not having that feeling that okay, I've done it, I've built the community, now I don't need to do anything else, um, is how a lot of communities collapse. So if you are thinking about running a community, if you're thinking about taking over a community, just know that that kind of maintenance is long-term. It's not short-term, it's not a growth hack. It is something that shows that through consistent investment, the community will do consistent loyalty and consistent feedback that allow you to make better products. For a community to be successful, there needs to be a shared space, a place where the function and activity of the community happens, where people come together. Here's Joe Nash again, 
on how to find and choose that place where your community can focus and thrive. So number, I guess my, my, my number two tip, um, you know, I mentioned their um, online platforms. I mentioned a couple of them, Discord, Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, I think one of the mistakes that people make when they start online communities is to kind of go with whatever the platform du jour is or to think about like, you know, what is the popular platform at the moment? Everyone's on Slack, everyone's on Discord, everyone's on XYZ. And to think of platform selection in terms of where people are rather than in terms of platform features. And again, to go to, you know, our reasons for participating the uh, that I spoke about earlier and the different reasons people join community. Um, in choosing a, a platform for your community, in choosing a home for your community, you really have to think about what, what is the reason that people are here and how do they expect to engage um so for example say you have a in-person meetup and you want to add an online space to that meetup right well one of the things about an in-person meetup especially for like a developer meetup is probably happening monthly it's probably happening on a fixed cadence um it's you know a thing that people expect to turn up every month and so your instinct might be to say well we want you know a persistent space for this where people can participate all the time let's add a discord chat let's add a whatsapp group let's add a telegram group but the members have come to engage with that group um, as an infrequent thing, as a thing that, you know, is time boxed and in their calendars and they turn up and they engage with it and then they go about their lives. And so to them, they may not be looking for something that's another thing they have to be, you know, checking every single day, right? That might not be this type of community they're looking for in it. And so if you add a, a synchronous chat platform like Discord, like WhatsApp, like Telegram, like Slack even, um, you are actually adding a community platform that's, uh, of a completely different mode to the community you've built and that the members weren't necessarily expecting. Whereas a forum is actually far closer to what they've come to expect. You know, it's uh, a thing where someone can, you know, slow mode conversations, um, they can time box it, etc. And so I guess that's my second tip is to think like the community that you want to build, it's not just about, hey, what's the community about? Who's going to be there? Um, and what platform is on it's you know it's about when do i expect those community members to engage um how often do i expect them to engage what else are they doing how do they know it's time to engage um how do they make space to engage um because those really drive the platform features that you're selecting for um and you know there are always, there are benefits to choosing the most popular thing um i call this the footfall effect you know if you imagine you're trying to set up a restaurant, you want a restaurant that's on the busy high street, right? Because people are going to walk past it and see it. And that's that's very much like, you know, what Slack has going for it. Slack has lots of drawbacks as a community tool. Um, but if nothing else, everyone uses Slack for work. And therefore, if your Slack is in that sidebar, you benefit from the footfall effect. However, increasingly, there are tools where we can benefit from the footfall effect. Um, whilst also having a more appropriate feature set. So I, I mentioned Discord a lot, and that's because, you know, Discord has traditionally been a gamer-centric tool, and so it's been very hard to use for developer communities. But now that more developer communities are using it, lots of developers are already there. And so it's now much easier to say, Discord has the moderation features I want, and I know that it's popular with the Python community already. So my Python community, my Python open source project, my Python meetup will benefit from the footfall effect from by being there. But we're not only community managers, we are also community participants. Here's Emily Freeman again. Developer communities are interesting in particular, specifically for companies whose audience and customer are technical. I think when you have a company like AWS who needs to reach technical builders and folks who are going to implement these services and this software, showing up in a way that one expresses gratitude for that community um, is very important and two shows up as a partner for these communities when we do things like contribute to rust um, or various other open source branches and, and tools it shows up as a partner and, and we really are able to contribute back to these communities but we also benefit from a way of, you know, awareness and engagement and, and ensuring that 
we're getting that feedback from these technical folks on what they're looking for, what challenges they're facing, how, how they're thinking about the future, um, what tools they're expecting for large companies to be shipping over the next five, 10 years. So it's, it's a valuable, um, I'm hesitant to say the word trade because it makes it transactional. And in my opinion, when you make communities transactional, that's the beginning of the end. You might as well uh, hang up your coat right there. But for me, it, it is really about large companies showing up as supporters, as partners. Um, and it's so cliche, but you know, Steve O'Grady is always talking about having these companies chop wood and carry water. I think that's critical to maintaining this balance within our industry. When we're out there representing our community or our company as developer relations practitioners, we need to be careful to avoid viewing our engagements as transactional. Here's Flo Dreis, who is a senior community program manager at Ivan, with some thoughts on that. In, in my opinion, communities uh, really make all the difference in an outcome of uh, event participation or any uh, activity that we do. I feel like community both uh, prepares the ground before we go somewhere and, and participate in something, uh, but it's also the key in successfully following up, making sure that we're not just um, there for uh, that that moment that our session takes or our talk takes, but that there is uh, something that that uh, continues and it just stays there and stays in the room and, and goes home with people uh, after an event uh, is done as well. I think I once wrote about how uh, developer advocates need to be better uh, event citizens because I've I've seen a lot of um, developer advocates go to an event uh, to give their talk and then either leave immediately or not uh, authentically participating in the event. And it, it made me angry at one point, uh, and I wrote a I wrote a whole rant <laughs> about it. Uh, but then after talking to my uh, colleagues in in uh, de uh, developer relations teams across different different companies, um, I figured that uh, speaking at a certain number of events was in their uh, in in the things that that got measured, right? Like that's that's how their impact um, on the company got measured. Um, and so, of course, um, of course, they they would see it almost as a transactional um, engagement, uh, even if in their heart of hearts they probably did know that uh, if they uh, that they would be more successful, maybe in the long term, but but definitely more successful. Um, and being asked to speak again if they had participated in uh, an event. As we've seen, communities plug into that fundamental human desire to come together and be part of something bigger than ourselves. Is there a risk, though, that we could accidentally or intentionally exploit that in a way that is morally questionable? Here's Sam Hepburn, Director of Community at Sneak, on how they've built their ambassador program to avoid exploitation. So yeah, when it comes to um, ambassador programs, we can find that there's like a fine line between looking after ambassadors and growing their profiles and presence within the community, and then the opposite side of that of becoming more of an exploitative space where we're taking a lot from the community. We've gamified things, we've got them involved in stuff, but we actually don't give as much back to the human. And I'd say the two things to get around that is, is one, if you are going to set up an ambassador program, is start small and do everything manually first. Speak to your community. You know, these are the most engaged people within your community. They should have, you know, monthly calls with you, one-on-ones. Why are they getting involved? What's in it for them? What would they like to see come out of becoming an advocate for your community? Um, because one, it is then easier to scale it in the longer run. But you'll also find that you have different types of personas. So here at Sneak, we have we went from having, I think, about seven ambassadors to we've just broken the 60 ambassador mark. Um, and I think the key thing there is, is there should always be something in it for the other person. And we should also understand that our advocates or our ambassadors all have different strengths and weaknesses. You know, we see this, like, what is that thing about if you measure, you know, the ability of a fish to climb a tree, it's never going to climb a tree. We rank our ambassadors in different areas of their professional expertise. So we have some ambassadors who will write blogs until the world comes home, but they're never going to stand on stage. We have some that will stand on stage and do talks, 
um, but not engage in other ways. We have some that will do a lot of, you know, jump on calls with our product team, do beta testing, do product feedback, but not engage in other ways. So one is to understand that every engineer is different and you can put your ambassadors into certain buckets because then you know what's kind of in it for them. So if we look at it from a publishing point of view, you know, are they trying to, you know, why are they wanting to write blogs? Can you share that content with them? You shouldn't just be taking the content, putting it on your website and not letting them be able to utilize it. I know there's SEO and I know there's a lot of things that makes you owning the content great. But again, if we're looking at it from a community point of view, you will have a stronger presence within the community if the ambassador feels like you are advancing their career in some way. One way of making sure that we're not being exploitative or otherwise letting our community members down is to be aware of and cater to regional and cultural differences. Here's Aditya Oberai, who is a developer advocate at AppRight. It's been quite interesting working for a global community uh, and, and trying to support a global community because for us um, at AppRight, I think one, one approach that we've taken is to try and, and you know, while we respect cultures, uh, we haven't tried to silo off the regions accordingly. This is one thing that a lot of communities do. And and I won't say there is a right or wrong here in the sense that I think uh, one example that I love to keep in mind here is Major League Hacking, where they've tried to have uh, region-specific activities to majorly account for time zone issues that might happen. Um, and they've had region-specific teams uh, so that um, you can have people interacting and collaborating with community members of the region. And I think it works wonderfully for them. Um, it does come down to the challenges of the community and the problem that you're trying to tackle this with. Uh, like for us, we've not always had that problem. Sometimes it does help to have people cover a language barrier. But uh, beyond that, I would say it's regardless of how a community structured it is necessary to appreciate and try and understand that anyway. One part of building a global developer community is the work of bringing that community to a new place. But what if you have no experience of a new country or a new city? Here's Eddie Diong Asipko, who is a senior developer advocate at Ambassador Labs. The first thing I would say is identify the community you want to build on, right? Like there are different tech ecosystems in Nigeria. So sometimes it could be that maybe there's already an existing developer community that addresses some of the things you want to address. Try to do some research on your end to see hey, does this already exist? Do I just partner with that person to make it a lot better? Or maybe it exists, but they're not doing it so well. I don't even want to start up your own. But having that background knowledge would be great because sometimes people would come and be like, oh, this is not similar to what, let's say, Oscar Fest is doing. Why are you doing the exact same thing? You could have easily collaborated with them. Um, Nigerians typically love more collaborating um, collaborating amongst people as opposed to wanting to do like an entirely new thing, which already exists. And then the second thing I would say is, assuming you do want to eventually proceed with building this developer community, is trying to build a social media presence for the community. The other thing would be speaking with existing people in this space, right? So let's say you're trying to create a developer community for Android developers. There are already Android developers in the ecosystem who are either sharing their knowledge or relatively talking about Android development. Maybe they don't have communities and that's fine. But it's always really essential to set up some calls with some of these people to just get a sense of where the ecosystem is at, right? Understand how things work for them, understand things they would hope to see in their community so that I could even get ideas from there to implement it into what you're currently building. And these people could also proceed to go ahead to say, support you on social media talk about what you're doing, and even recommend you to people who would reach out to them. Now, it's easy to think that maybe the whole world speaks English, particularly in tech, where so much is based in English. But of course, that's not true. Here's Daniel Reis, who runs developer communities in Brazil and is also a developer advocate at ScyllaDB, talking about how to address the language barrier if you only speak English. Uh, okay, first, uh, I think that the, the, the language is... Um, the most important thing. I know that the international communities are majority run by English, but uh, here in Brazil, we don't have so much people that actually speaks or try to interact in English. So if we can add, if you want to bring some Brazilians to some international community, 
maybe some English classes or make uh, accessible for them, it will be really, 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 really nice. One of the, the biggest things here in Brazil today is that uh, all of the developers, they're, they have the, they're scared to be trying to speak English. They probably know, but uh, they wait for people just mocking them because it's not good enough or they just don't simply don't don't, don't want to. But uh, at the same way, when someone tries to interact to bring their, 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 their attention by mentioning Brazil, probably it's a good move. Like you show that you care about the Brazilian developers or the Brazilian communities. Just by mentioning uh, anything about our, our culture or our daily basis and things like that. The flip side to having a plan and knowing what tactics to deploy is measurement. Here's Matthew Stratton, Director of Developer Relations at Ivan. I think when we think about measurement, there's a few things we have to look at. This is generally true, and then this connects into everything else. So the first thing is that um, a measure can become a target. When a measure becomes a target, then that influences behavior. So we always want to look for unintentional consequences when we measure. And I always I like to think about measurements that are goals, where we have a number we want to get to, or something like that. But then also the measurements that they're fine. They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, and they're 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 ways of of learning. And both of those are valuable. So the first thing, and this is a general thought, is when you're thinking about what you're measuring, are you measuring to a target? Or are you measuring just to see an impact, to see effectiveness, right? And if it's the latter, it's one of those things where if that number dips, that's okay because you learned a thing, right? When I think about things like developer relations and community and all these places where we we tend to, to have long conversations about how, what can you measure and what's tangible and intangible and all of these things, there's lots of things that are intangible. But if we can take care of the things that are tangible, that makes it a lot easier to not have to justify the intangibles, right? We can't all be based on vibes. So your measures should be derived from the outcomes you're trying to accomplish, not, but not the other way around because then the outcomes are driven by the thing you know how to measure. And it's, you might have to do some imagination to connect it to, to a business goal, but there should be some, you should be able to draw that and not have to, to guess. So if you're saying, Okay, so number of people in the community, that's a measurement, right? And you ostensibly want to make that number go up because the more people that are in your community, the more people that are aware, these are people that are participating in one way or another. And again, your community members are not necessarily users of your product. They can be part of the larger conversation of that. They can be influential. And I don't mean that in a you know Instagram influencer way, but just they are folks that are part of that community. They may never give you any money. They may never even use your product directly, but they're part of the conversation and they're welcomed into that community. So that's another one to think about is that it's not necessarily about, your community is not necessarily just made up of the people who use your API, but maybe if your API is around this way of doing geospatial data, well, the geospatial community is the big community that you're part of. And there are people that are that are a piece of that. So when you're thinking about those measures, that's what I'm saying, the size of people in the community is not a direct connection to other business metrics, but it gives you that uh, ability of folks who are able to find each other and connect into that. And then what you would look at and say, like, how can you measure how your community is touching those other goals that your organization has, right? Maybe it is user signups. Maybe that's a thing that matters. And maybe, you know, we don't want to sit there and just say, okay, well, to join our meetup, you have to sign up for our product, you know, because that's not actually helpful. But we could sit there and say, are we seeing that our community members are impacting with our product in this way or, or interacting with our product in this way or what percentage of our community members um, participate in this other event that we have or this other thing we have a business connection for because there's a lot of interesting things you can glean and then your community are also valuable uh, friction reporting back in as well. So the more that you can connect that to other types of business outcomes, I think is is helpful because that also helps justify everything. And then all the things that don't connect directly, they kind of take care of themselves because you've, you've kind of eaten your vegetables and said, how does this connect and what's the value? The biggest thing is that 
even everything that feels like it's intangible is actually measurable in one way or another. You might have to do just a little bit more. Making sense of all the data that your community generates can be a real challenge. Over the years, we've gone from largely ignoring it in some cases to having fancy spreadsheets. Lately, we're lucky enough to have a suite of dedicated tools that can help us to make sense of developer communities, what's working and what's not. Here's Rebecca Marshburn, who is head of community at Common Room, on the importance of using a tool to help measure and understand your developer community. I have the ones that I love. Um, I work for a tool that I love, but like that's not what this is about. I'm just saying there are now tools out there that will help you measure, define, understand what is happening in your community. When I first started this role three years ago, and I, I came from a, a background in um, running the serverless heroes program, the AWS serverless heroes program at AWS. When I came to Common Room, right, I was like, man, it is really hard to walk into a, you know, a weekly meeting with VPs and SVPs and have a screenshot of a tweet that had a lot of likes. Um, that was the most painful part of, of sorting that program, right? Where you're like, here you go, here's some numbers. Um, and, and it's just a screenshot. And I, I would tell people that it felt like I had to nail something into the wall and all I had was a flimsy shoe. And I could do it, you could kind of do it, like it kind of works and it can kind of hold something at the end of it by banging on that nail with a shoe. But there are now tools out there that is actually a hammer. That's actually the tool for the job. Use them. Use a tool. Um, and so whatever it is that, that, that the tool that you use, choose the tool that's going to allow you to measure what you set forth in your strategy based on who you're laddering up to, right? And so if your product team is like, we want to know how our like, power users, how our champions are growing um, are proliferating inside those specific accounts who are in those industries. And we want to know, you know, their sentiment. We want to know how much they're engaging our community. We want to understand how many um, pull requests they've made. We want to be able to prioritize, um, you know, answering their questions um, the fastest with by the person who they're most comfortable with, who they've interacted with the most on our team or, you know, or the community member. Um, whatever it is that, that they want to know, right, then, then I think you really need to adjust your measurements and choose your tool um, and make sure that that tool works for that. So I don't think there's any like one way of saying this is how you should measure. I think it's about there are now abilities for you to set the criteria for what you want to measure and then to ask your internal stakeholders the people you ladder up to, you know, what would be important to them and then to match those things. And so find the tool that's, that works for you, find the tool, understand what your internal teams want to see, understand how that tool has those capabilities in order, like how to use it in order to measure those things and then report on it consistently, right? Report, 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 report on it. And those measurements might look different. It might be firmographic data, right? Like what's going on at organizations. It might be individual data, um, the who and the what. Um, you know, maybe they're big names or big influencers or big contributors in your community. Um, it might be account-based data, right? Like how are you growing um, power users or just usage in general? Do more people log in to your product in this very important account um, over the last month than not? So. There are so many ways once you have the right data, once you have the right capability to see and access that data available through tools now. So choose a tool, match it to what you want to see from your um, internal stakeholder teams, and then report, report, report. So we've looked at what communities are, why people join communities, and also why companies pay for them, along with some tips on community strategy and practical day-to-day -day running of communities, followed by some thoughts on how to measure your community. Let's leave the final thought with Wesley Faulkner. One thing that I would like to emphasize is that community work, just like a lot of developer relation work, is not seen by the public. There is things that 
look easy, like managing a forum, managing a Slack channel, Discord, those types of things. But there is a lot of pre-planning and a lot of strategy that's very nuanced and subtle. Being able to know that is a practice that takes time. So give a lot of grace to those who are starting and have a lot of grace for those that are doing it. It's, it's not easy, it's difficult, and it is a practice that you need to put in practice continuously to make sure that you keep making those mistakes and keep moving forward. It's extremely experiential and it's not formulaic. So it, it may seem like you just give people what they need but in order to make sure that they're heard, you, you have to make sure that you are able to understand the depth of their knowledge in both the thing that they're talking about, but also the significance of its importance, whatever that they're talking about. And you have to figure out how to do that in a very respectful manner, manner and uh, not to be demeaning and to make sure that even messages that seem like they're private can be screenshot and put in public. So you have to make sure you maintain your integrity and maintain the respect from everyone, whether that they are in your community or out. So it's, it's, a, it's a practice that takes a lot of patience and will drain even the most compassionate person. So make sure that if you are managing community managers, that you give them a lot of space and you help them wherever they need.